your Bibles, we'll go to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 19. Uh, as Amy was telling that story, I'd forgotten about that car. I had a lot of forgettable cars, I'll just tell you that. Uh, when we traded in that Dodge Diplomat, I remember my father-in-law had done the brakes on that car, and it was not driving well at all. And uh, I told Amy, I said, I think it's time for this car to die. And uh, so anyway, I remember when we drove it in there as the, as the uh, salesman took that car out to drive it to see what he was going to give us on trade-in, which we should have paid him something to take that car and drive it. Um, it was making the screaming noise that it made and lurching down the highway. And so really quickly, they made a U-turn and came back, and he said, who did the brakes on this, on this car? I said, my father-in-law. And he said, don't ever let that man touch any automobile you ever have again. That was his word to me that day, and I said, yeah, and I never did. And uh, my father-in-law was a great man, but he was not a mechanic at all. So that car mercifully died, and anyway, we, we have a, a long and checkered past with cars, so... We'll just say that. The coolest car I've ever driven is the RAV4 that I have right now. I'll just tell you that. That's the coolest car I've ever had. All right, Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. Uh, last week, we talked about how to be a shining light in, in the world, in the, quick, in, the, in, the, in the crooked and twisted generation that we're in. That's what Paul called his generation, crooked, twisted, perverse. And if he could say that of his generation, how much more can we say that of our generation? And he said, but you're to be a shining light. And so I love the way that, that God does this through the Apostle Paul. He says, now, okay, I'm going to give you two examples. So we get to those examples this morning in Timothy and Epaphroditus. Uh, they encouraged the heart of Paul. They encouraged the heart of those around them. They epitomized what it is to be a servant and a soldier. I was thinking this morning, a story came to mind. I think I've told it in a sermon before, but it just, the Lord just put it on my heart uh, just a few moments ago when we were working down in, in the Amazon in, in Peru and planting that church down in Nuevo Jardin. I, I had a situation, we had a situation where one of the ladies that was coming over to the church service that night, she was injured. She had put her children in the boat, and when she went to pull the the, the, the ripcord on the, on the motor, uh, her hair got caught in the motor and it pulled her head down into the casing of that motor and it knocked her out, knocked her into the water and she was unconscious and her, her little girl got out of the boat and went over to the edge of the water and started screaming for the men of the village to come and help. They did, they got her out of the water, uh, but she was hurt pretty badly. It, it, it gashed her head really badly and um, we had to take her to the doctor that night. It was coming a massive storm, and so we we got all the electricity was out, both villages, and the men of that village came over and said, "You have a speedboat." They called it. It really wasn't a speedboat. It was just faster than their little pecky peckies that they went up and down the Amazon with. And, and so I said, "Would you take her to the doctor?" And so. Uh, we got in that boat that night, and I mean, it was just coming a storm as only can come in the, in the Amazon, or here lately, you know. Um, and we got in that boat, and we headed down the Amazon, and it was just bad. And there's a lot of debris, and there's a lot of logs in the Amazon, and just stuff that washes down into it. And so uh, I remember there was a man who was in the house, across from the house that we had built in that village, and his name was Vladimir. And Vladimir, I, this is like one of those things that Amy talks about that will just stick in your mind. I'll always have this image in my mind. When I think about a servant and a soldier of the cross, um, I remember, and he was, hadn't been saved that long, but he got up in the, in the top of that boat and he held a spotlight. And it took a while to get to where we were going to get to the doctor. Uh, he, he stood up there in that pouring rain and in that wind, and he held that spotlight for two hours going, and he held it all the way coming back. And he, he just took that spotlight the whole time, and he'd taken off his shirt, and he just got up there as streamlined as he could, and he stood there for hours, and he just took that spotlight and just did that across that water while that, while that pilot, while he went around all the things out there that were in the Amazon, he just did that for hours, standing up in the pouring rain in the wind. 
I'll always have that picture in my mind. I thought, what a man. What a man. He came, he came up to about here on me. Now, he's a little guy. But, man, he stood up there, and he, he, was, he was doing the job that night. And I thought, all kinds of ways that we can serve. And what a picture he was for me. And just etched in my mind, this is what Timothy and Epaphroditus was. That's what, what, what they were for Paul. Uh, they were a picture etched in his mind. They were written on his soul. And what he says about these two men, it ought not just instruct us, but man, we ought to strive. This is what we ought to be. Uh, we ought to strive for this. And let's see what he has to teach us today about being a shining light and gives us these two examples of what it is to be servants, what it is to be soldiers of the cross. You stand with me as we honor God in the reading of his word. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 19. He says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. What he says here of Timothy, for I have no one like him. That's high praise. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. He moves from Timothy all the high praise of Timothy and to think what he's giving up as he sends Timothy. He moves from him to a second fellow, and that Epaphroditus. Verse 25, I thought it necessary to send to you, Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. Now look at how many descriptors he layers upon this guy. Look at that verse again. My brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, your messenger, minister. Five descriptors he gives to Epaphroditus. Wow. For he has been longing for you. He's been longing for you all. He's been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. And, and I love the language there because he's, as he layers descriptors upon Epaphroditus, all those things he says of him, all the description. And then he says, if I lose him, I will have sorrow upon sorrow. Think of the layers of sorrow in Paul's heart if he loses him. And notice how close he was to losing him. Verse 28, I'm the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Let's pray. Father, what examples we have. Lord, you give us examples as we walk through our lives in church life. You give us example after example. If we will really focus in, if we will really do the work that you've called us to do, you bring alongside brothers and sisters in Christ. They are examples of what it is to be lights in the world examples of what it is to be a servant, examples of what it is to be a soldier of the cross. Thank you for that. Lord God, some are more dramatic than others, but thank you for that, that we can serve alongside one another and we can do this in each other's lives and be encouragers to each other. Thank you. God, I pray you'll take this word and as we examine what it is to be a servant, to be a soldier, help as we look at the lives of these two men, help us to be like this. Lord God, empower us to be this, I pray. Thank you, Jesus. Speak to us and move by your Holy Spirit in this place, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So he, he begins here with Timothy. He says, let me show you what a shining light looks like. R regard Timothy, if you will. He was a servant. I mean, that, that epitomized who he was. Paul was his father in the gospel and his spiritual father and Timothy was like a son to him and he said this guy is a servant he he shows the servanthood in the man 
by saying that he served with me in the gospel. Verse 22, he speaks that word and he says, what makes him so special is not only is he serving with me, but he has the right motive and he's, he's got the right one that he's looking to. He serves Jesus. He serves in the interest of Jesus Christ. And what flows from that, if you will see in verse 20, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. So here we have a man who has a servant's heart. He's alongside the Apostle Paul. His focus is on the Lord Jesus, not on, not on other people primarily. But he says, I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus. That's my captain. And out of that then flows service to others. If we will get our eyes on Jesus first and off of other people, it will help us as we walk through being a servant that God has called us to be within the body. If we keep our eyes on ourselves, and even if we keep our eyes on others first, then we will become disgruntled. We will become dissatisfied. Sometimes we will become disgusted. But listen, as we keep our eyes on Jesus, he's the primary one that we're working for. We're working as unto him. And then what flows from that, and this is such a beautiful example, what flows from that then is that we then have these beautiful partnerships in the gospel, and then we serve one another. This is what Timothy did. The word is interesting in verse 20 there, the word like. I have no one like him. Uh, the word there in, in the Greek is uh, a, a, a sopsikos. It means a similar spirit. It means being like-minded. It has this meaning to it to be almost one soul, a kindred spirit. Paul was saying, I've got nobody like him who I connect with in this way. It is as though we are one in this. Our soul is one. That's how close his kinship spiritually was and how much affection he had for this man who was a servant. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 4 and 10, and I think he echoes Paul's sentiment here about Timothy, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. And so, as God pours his grace out upon you, as he pours his riches out upon you, and he gives you these gifts. in each one of you, if you've been saved, hear me on this. If you've been saved, if you've been born again, if you've asked Christ to come live inside of you, he has given each of you at least one spiritual gift and sometimes more. And so out of that grace, he says, take that spiritual gift and now use it not only to serve me, but flowing from that to serve others. And Paul says, me and Timothy, we're one in this. This is exactly what he does. He exhibits this. Then he says, I've got nobody like him. Think about the high praise from the apostle Paul when he utters that phrase, I've got no one else like him. Seeks the interest of Christ. And then he seeks the interest of others. Those things go hand in hand. Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia in chapter 5 and verse 13 when he says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You see this all through Scripture. Serve one another. That is glorious in the church when we will do that, when we will serve one another. It's all so messy, isn't it, at times? Adrian Rogers, who pastored for decades over Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. I love to, to hear Adrian Rogers. I could say that he's a great preacher from the last century, you know, not, not, not in the too far past, but in the last century, and he's been gone a few years now, but man, he had such a simple way of putting things and yet so profound. Here's what he says about servanthood. He says, you're to care for me, and I am to care for you. There's no room in a church for arrogance. There's no room in a church for envy. There's no room in a church for rivalry. There's no room in a church for self-sufficiency or disunity. God put you here not to be served, but to serve, to minister to others. Is this what your life is about? Does it take that progression? You know, Paul says, first of all, he's a partner, and then he's serving others. But he said, where does that flow from? from serving Christ, first and foremost, is that the progression of your life? Does the ministry to others flow out of this that ultimately I'm serving Christ? Is that the attitude to be a servant? That's premier when you think about 
Shining is a light in the world. Yes, you're in the midst of dark times. Yes, in many ways, you're in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, just like Paul said of his day. What the first century church was enveloped in, and we find ourselves more and more in the same kind of cultural context today. But if we, if we focus on that, it'll become hopeless. But if we will focus on this, that we serve the Lord Christ that we are shining lights in the midst of that generation. And then, I love this, he says, so I'm going to give you two examples to look at, and this first one's Timothy. Do you serve like that? Do you serve Jesus like that? Do you serve others like that? That's a good question as you examine where your life is. But he gives a second person here as an example. We don't know much about Epaphroditus, and much of what we know about him is found right here. But... Man, what a word. What a word here. A fellow worker, a fellow soldier, the Scripture says. And as I've already mentioned, all the things that he layers upon this guy when he talks about him, how dear he was. And so it's almost like he says, this Timothy, who I'm like one soul with, he said, man, if you'll take that and you just put alongside him Epaphroditus. These were guys, it would be hard to give them up, and yet Paul was willing for them to go and minister to the church in Philippi when he needed them so desperately himself. And, and Epaphroditus, if you look at the Scripture there, look at what all he risked. They were concerned as he was going to the Apostle Paul to minister to him. He became ill. And it says in verse 26 that he, Epaphroditus, has been longing for you all, has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. So he, even in his illness, he was more concerned for them. I, I'm, I'm concerned that they're worrying about me. And Paul says, indeed, he was ill. And near to death, but God had mercy on him. And here you see the love that he has for this man when he says, not only on him, but God had mercy on me also. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He said, I would have just been burdened with layer of sorrow upon layer of sorrow had I lost him. But God was merciful. And he said, I'm the more eager to send him. Therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and so that I may be less anxious. Paul was concerned about them. So receive him and the Lord with all joy and honor such men as these, these two men, Timothy, Epaphroditus. And, and look, at, look at what he risked to go minister to the Apostle Paul. He nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. This was a man who... He didn't think about his own skin. He didn't think about his own neck. He just went and he ministered, and he almost lost his life. And he says, this is what it is to be a soldier of the cross, to be willing to give everything. Paul used this again and again, and I love the way things sometimes are circular in Scripture. So he's, he's sort of boasting in the Lord on Timothy here, and then he comes to Epaphroditus, and he says, Timothy's a great example of what it is to be a servant of the cross. Epaphroditus is such a good example of a soldier of the cross, and think about all that he risked. And so later, it circles back around, and Paul says, Timothy, let me encourage you with something. Just what Epaphroditus did, let me encourage you with it also. And in 2 Timothy 2 and 3, he says, to Timothy, share in suffering as what? As a good soldier of Christ Jesus. See, the servant and the soldier go hand in hand. We are truly in God's army. He is the general. He is the leader. He is the one that we look to. And he says, you're to be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, he said this about being a soldier I love this quote. He says, once again, the true soldier is an ambitious man. He pants for honor, seeks for glory. On the field of strife, he gathers his laurels, and amidst a thousand dangers, he reaps renown. The Christian is fired by higher ambitions than earthly warriors ever knew. He sees a crown that can never fade. He loves a king who, best of all, is worthy to be served he has a motive within him which moves him to the noblest deeds and the divine spirit impelling him in the most self-sacrificing actions. Thus, you see, the Christian is a soldier. And it is one of the main things in the Christian life to earnestly contend for the faith and to fight with valor against sin. You're a soldier of the cross. Don't you ever forget that. Paul, as he was 
writing concerning Onesimus, and, and he was writing to Philemon, and, and he was addressing the church in that letter and asking for Onesimus and for him to be received back. He starts that letter in the first two verses like this, and notice the language, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, is another way of saying servant. And Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our, look at this, our fellow soldier and the church in your house. How often he used these two pictures, the servant and the soldier. Those things go hand in hand. If you're a soldier, if you've been a soldier, you understand this. You're a servant. You have command over, someone over you, commanding you. You go where they say. You do what they say. This is why the picture is so powerful. This is how we're to see the Lord Jesus. This is how we're to serve the Lord Jesus. To serve Him, but to understand that we are a soldier under His command. He is Lord of your life. He is Lord of my life. I love the the fact that here Paul gives this great discourse. If you back up a few verses, and he says that we are to, in verse 15, be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And he says, now let me show you what that looks like. Here's two guys that are going to illustrate that. Does your life illustrate that? There's much to emulate here. And and Jesus gives us the power and the drive to to emulate, to, to do. We are, you and I, you personalize this, okay? You and I, we are fellow servants. You and I, we are fellow soldiers of the cross. And that's how we are shining lights in our world today. I think about uh, that old hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. We don't sing that much anymore. You know, but that used to be a standard when I was a kid, a little church that I grew up in. I think about Timothy and Epaphroditus and Paul, and I think about this song, how beautifully written and how strong. It speaks to the fact that Jesus leads that he's our commander. It speaks to the fact as we focus on him and we follow his orders that Satan flees, that he runs away. It speaks to the fact that we are united. It speaks to the fact that in our battle we praise the Lord no matter how difficult it gets and that we continually move out following Jesus. Think about the words of that song, Onward Christian Soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe. Forward into battle, you see his banner go. We focus on him, don't we? That's what they did. The second stanza says, And at the sign of triumph, Satan's host doth flee. On then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundation quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices loud, your anthems raise. We are united. Like a mighty armor moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided. All one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. We praise God because of how he leads us, right? Onward then, ye people, join our happy throng. Blend with ours your voices in the triumph song. Glory, laud, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages men and angels sing. And the refrain goes on as we move out and we follow Jesus as he leads. As Satan runs away, as we are united, as we praise God, the refrain comes, onward Christian soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. This is what our calling is. I got to go uh, to the Empower Conference a couple of weeks ago and spend some time with some of my, some of my brothers in the convention and uh, just enjoy getting to, be, getting to be around them, enjoy getting to see Ryan Fontenot and speak with him a little bit, um, enjoy getting to see Nathan Lorick, and some of y'all remember when he served here uh, as youth minister, and he's now uh, executive director of our state convention. So God's done great things in his life, and we uh, confirmed and affirmed him there in that. And as I walked through the door, 
uh, Nathan shook my hand and he said, I hear great things are happening in Wascom. And I said, well, praise the Lord. Uh, give him the honor and the glory for it. And, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you're hearing those things. So, so hopefully somebody in here is giving a good word to Nathan whenever they talk to him on the phone. And, uh, but he said, good things are happening in Wascom. And he said, I hear it. I said, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm honored to hear that. He's a fellow soldier and he's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is using him to lead our entire state, uh, Southern Baptists in our entire state. But I think about guys that are field strategists that are doing just part-time work, you know, serving in churches and field strategists in the, in the convention. I think about my friend T.C. Melton who did that for years out in West Texas and how he has served and he's still serving and he's still, he's still writing and he published a book on how to pastor a Baptist church and it's, it's phenomenal. Um, I think about how T.C. preceded me out in Odessa at Sherwood Baptist Church there and what a phenomenal work he did for a year and a half, just doing much needed work in ministry in that church, paving the way for when God would call me to that church. Uh, I think in the same position, I think about Mike Landry who followed me out at Sherwood out there and who's there at the convention and we stopped and we talked and we visited and he's serving He's serving. Wherever the convention says go, that's where he goes. He does, and he, he does interim work at different churches and just does an amazing, amazing job. Um, uh, you know, I think about his connection here into Wascom is he's related to, to Ruby, Miss Ruby. Um, I got to talk with John McGuire. Y'all familiar with Brother John? And what a servant, what a soldier of the cross he is. And and we visited about him going through the, the ice storm. You know, you saw some of what he had to endure on, on that. They were without power like seven or eight days, something like that. And without water for part of that time, he had pipes burst in his house. And he, he was taking me through that, that whole journey of what they went through and cooked their meals on the, on the fireplace for that entire week. And, and, uh, but I'm thinking, man, he's out there serving. He's out there encouraging, encouraging pastors. He knows, he knows everybody here from here to kingdom come, you know. And just does a phenomenal job. And you know the, the heart he has, the love he has, the servant-mindedness that he has. Um, I just think about those guys. They're an encouragement to me. And, you know, then I think, God, you, you have put those people around me my entire Christian walk. My entire ministry life, I've had those guys around me that can teach me, that can plug into my life, that can disciple me. I think back to my first pastor at Dell Dozier, who's passed on, and he's gone to be with the Lord now. Uh, he died a few years ago, 90 years of age. And uh, I think about how much he spoke into my life, how, how gently he would correct me at times when I needed it, um, how when he came and he joined our church, uh, I just loved the word he spoke to me. He, he had pastored that church before, and he said, he said, I realize, he said, that two men can ride a horse, but, but only one can ride in front. And I thought, what a word. What a word that was. And he yielded and submitted to my leadership. And at the same time, God used him to disciple me. Think about people like that who served alongside that, that, that my heart just melded with. We became almost like one soul, like what Paul's saying here, like. Kindred spirits. Um, God has been so gracious to me through my ministry in that and putting so many people alongside. And then I just think about the, the three churches that I have pastored and the one that I did some ministry work in and surrendered to, to the ministry prior to full-time vocational ministry. And I think about all the people that God has brought alongside and all the fellow servants, all the soldiers of the cross. God's been good to me. And I would, I would fail to be the preacher I ought to be if I didn't stand and say how good God has been to me. And I think about all the churches through the years. I think about Second Baptist Church Andrews. I think about Sherwood Baptist Church in Odessa. And I think about First Baptist Church Wascom. God has been so good to me. That's why the entirety of my ministry career, I think God has, has allowed me to stay in places a long time. Uh, and he's provided such wonderful folks around me. That's what y'all are. Y'all are servants of the cross. Y'all are soldiers of the cross. You understand that you have marching orders. You serve each other because you know that you serve Christ first. And I appreciate that attitude very, very much. Let's keep that attitude at the forefront. 
Let's always serve and let's always soldier in that way. And if we'll do that, God will keep peace here. God will keep victory here. Satan's forces will flee from here if we'll keep Jesus the main thing. And here's what will happen if we are servants and soldiers like what these two men are and we're empowered by Jesus to do that. What will happen is we will be shining lights in our generation. And that's what God has called us to. Let me pray over us this morning. Uh, you bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord in prayer and just ask the Lord to do whatever He wants to do during this time. Justice is going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. If you have a decision to make, we would invite you to come. If you need to join with this church, we'd invite you to come. The Lord's leading you in that way. It's only if He's leading you in that way. Uh, if you've made a decision to receive Christ as your Savior at some point, we'd invite you to come and follow in believer's baptism. Uh, if you need to know Jesus as Savior, your heart has been warmed this morning and you're convicted and say, I want to know this Jesus that you speak of. It is a free gift. It is a free gift. You won't work to get it. It is by grace through faith you've been saved. This not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's a free gift. We're the hand of the beggar reaching out and just taking the gift of salvation that Jesus offers. And we just say yes to it. In this place right now, if you want to know Jesus as your Savior, you can simply and make this your prayer. Just pray to Him right now. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And Jesus, thank You for dying on the cross for my sins. I turn from trusting myself and going my own way. Lord, I want to follow You. And I ask You to save me. Be the Lord of my life. Just pray that to Him. Just say it to Him right now. Save me, Jesus. I trust you with my life. You'll pray that to him. He'll, he'll hear. His promise is he'll hear. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I want you to take just a second, just a moment here, and just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. Just in your heart, tell him. It's based on his promise. It's his free gift that he's giving to you. You don't work to get it. But if you ask Him to save you this morning, just say, thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Whatever the Lord puts on your heart this morning, just in your heart, just tell Him, yes, Lord. You may can do that right where you are. You may need to come to the...